Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here in Davos and around the world. Uh, I am Henry Blodgett. I'm the editor-in-chief of Business Insider. And we have a wonderful panel today. One of the hotbeds of innovation and growth in the world economy right now is financial technology, different and new payment systems, <coughs> business systems, or changing everything about how we interact with money and how we pay each other. And we have a wonderful panel to explore the trends that are driving that today. Um, before I introduce everybody, we will focus, it, it, a lot of the innovation is going on in Asia in particular. In fact, half of the global investment in f financial technology is in Asia. So we will focus on that as we examine the question of what are the trends that are driving this revolution and where are we going from here? Um, and we really are incredibly fortunate to have such a wonderful panel with us. I'll, I'll introduce everybody very briefly and then, and then we'll jump right in. On my left is, is Francisco Gonzalez, who's the group executive chairman of BB VA, which is one of the largest banks in Spain and also one of the leading digital banks in the world. And, and one of the things you'll notice about the panel in general is just how many people these companies and, and technologies touch. I think the panel as a whole is reaching or providing <coughs> platforms for more than a billion people worldwide. And BBVA in particular, this is a 160-year-old company with 63 million customers. So just an incredible reach. Um, Next, Cecilia Skingsley, who is the deputy governor of the Central Bank of Sweden, um, which is responsible, as other, other central banks are, for setting monetary, monetary policy and having a safe and efficient payment system for Sweden. Um, lots of regulatory issues that go along with that that, we, that touch everything that happens every day on innovation. Um, Eric Jing is the CEO of Alipay which is a tremendously successful and large payment system in China that grew up organically over the past 10 years. 450 million users in China alone, and recently has been expanding beyond China, now has more than 200 million users with its partners outside of China. Um, and to give you just an example of how fast it's growing, in the golden week um, in, in 2016, the company in terms of Transactions outside China did four times as many tra transactions as the year before, so radically changing everything, and we will talk with Eric about that. Um, next, Dan Schulman is the CEO of PayPal, which is one of the original fintech disruptors and is, in fact, almost a, a middle-aged company now relative to um, some of the other newer companies out there. Um, PayPal has 200 million users in 200 countries around the world. Um, and millions of merchants and has now other payment platforms like Venmo, which is a new person-to-person -person payment system in the United States. Uh, very exciting. Um, and then on the end, uh, David Craig, who's the president of financial and risk for Thomson Reuters. David runs a massive global technology and information platform <coughs> that many of the payment providers and banks and financial services companies use for information and transaction all day, uh, all every day. Huge number of transactions, 450 professionals around the world in 150 companies. So let's, uh, 150 countries. So let's jump right in. Dan, given your status as one of the original fintech disruptors, what, what trends enabled PayPal to be launched now 15 to 20 years ago? And, and what is enabling the continuing growth from here? Yeah. I think there are two uh, meta trends that are inexorable and just continuing uh, to uh, accelerate. First is that currencies of all kind are digitizing. Checks are disappearing, although 85% of the world's transactions are still in cash. They're increasingly digitizing. And so you've got money in general digitizing. And whether that be in the form of cards, they will digitize, or actually currency itself will start to digitize as well. So uh, you're seeing that happening. But all of that is enabled really by the explosion of mobile uh, into the marketplace. You probably have 80% penetration of mobile right now in the world's population. Next five years, call it about 90%. And there are two trends that happen with mobile. One for consumers is you have all the power of a bank branch in the palm of your hand right now. And so basic consumer financial transactions can be done um, quickly. Uh, you don't need to stand in line to make the transaction. You can do it immediately. They're simple and easy to understand. They're more secure than money. There's a lot of leakage in money. And uh, finally, they're much less expensive. 
Uh, the digital world uh, can be 80 to 90% less expensive to serve a customer uh, than through traditional bank branches. And so you're going to have an explosion of kind of uh, platforms that manage and move money for consumers. On the retail side, retail is going through a fundamental transformation due to mobile as well. There used to be distinct worlds of online uh, and offline. Mobile is blurring the distinction between online and offline. If uh, you make a uh, purchase using your mobile phone and pick it up in store, is that mobile uh, or online or is that offline? It's actually a combination. It's just commerce. And more and more retailers are now taking a look at what Amazon and others are doing and thinking, how do I compete? How do I use the mobile phone to get closer, to become more intimate with my customer? And digital payments is a key driver of that, integrating rewards as a, as a currency type, it's, uh, that kind of thing. So those trends, those secular trends, are driving growth through all regions of 20% plus easily um, throughout the world. And uh, we only see those continuing to accelerate. And Eric, are those these same trends that are driving Alipay's growth? And as you expand beyond that, is something different in Asia? Uh, let me uh, start by showing one story, true story in China. Uh, in China, there was a, a county you call it Dingzhi County, which is just located by under Everest Mountain, very far away, right? A very small population. So you know, previously, it's, very hard. it's such a big challenge for them to make a payment. Payment to them is something very, very far away, right? They can walk you know, tens of miles to, you know, to buy something. You know, if you want to make a transfer to some other people, it's even far away, you know, they have to go to some branches to do that, very, very far away. But today, by having mobile phone, you know, see, it's such easier for them to buy something from Alibaba, from Taobao, using mobile phone, and make a money transfer via Alipay apps. Very easily to can do that. So it's greatly improve their lives, give them such a convenience for them. So that's their true story. So to me, the next generation, of financial systems, or a big trend, I think there are two things. Number one is more technology will be applied into this sector. More technology. We, have, we know that you know, mobile technology help us to increase the reach. So we can reach out to millions of people, right? Hundreds of millions of people in a very cost-effective cost way. Number one, people are talking about cloud computing can bring down the cost of Processing, processing costs dramatically, right? And uh, with cloud computing in place, so basically give us a bit uh, a capability to launch your new products in a very short period of time, very short period of time. So you can quickly launch your new, new products. And uh, by having big data, increase your capability to manage the risks, right? By having that, you can do the credit rating to giving out uncollateralized financing or loans to SMEs. So these are, you know, talk about, uh, these are technologies that have been applied in China, this sector to reshape, redefine service products. But today, we are also seeing uh, AI, deep learning, machine learning technologies, biometrics, right, will be used to do the KYC or give you a kind of, you know, I mean, to, to protect the account. So these are, we are seeing more new technology applied, increasingly applied into this sector to really change, change the, I mean, to innovate. Uh, this is number one. Secondly, I mean, our new generation, a new, new generation of financial system will be more inclusive, focusing on the little guys, focusing on those underserved or unserved, including SMEs, because previously, in traditional way, it's very hard for, for institutions to really offer appropriate products for them in a sustainable way, in a for, you know, I mean, cost-effective way. So people, I mean, for many of them, does not easily can get, get, access, get access to the financial service. But today, it's different. So we can make the world more inclusive. We can bring the financial service, I mean, products to just, you know, I mean, underserved people to give them, to bring the equality to them. 
to give them more, I mean, improve their lives and then provide loans, unconnected loans, unconnected loans, SMEs to help them grow their business, help them to create more jobs. So today, so the second thing, so quite different. I mean, uh, tech, new tech, more technology will be applied into this sector to reshape, redefine the service products. And we are focusing more on the inclusiveness uh, to provide inclusive financial inclusion to the people. So there are two trends, two opportunities. So basically, for example, I'll give you a number. For right now, over one third of our, our users, we're talking about 450 four, million, right, active users in China. So over one third of them are really from rural areas, from villages. So taking, I mean, the county as an example, the county is located in, located in Tibet. All the Tibet, there, from Anipay's data, we can see that their mobile payment accounts for 90% of overall electronic payments. They are the highest mobile payment penetration in that. So by having this technology, we can really, I mean, bridge the gap for the people in the West, West and the people in the developed East. So that's what I mean. That's the trend emerging in, our, in, our, in China. And Francisco, in running a 160-year-old bank, when you see what's happening with PayPal and Alipay and, and so much of the other innovation, are you terrified? Are you excited? Do you feel that they are complementary to you? Are they a threat to you? And how do you, how do you adapt as, as such an old company? I am excited, excited frankly, because um, we have uh, been working on turning the bank to digital house for 10 years now. <coughs> and, um, we tried and we are in that process of being so agile and, and so efficient as the newcomers. Um, it's not easy, it, it takes time, but our edge is that we have, we have started this process back in the day, 10 years ago. So those guys um, either are in some part of the value chain, payments for example, and financial probably is spreading uh, its products, and we are yeah, a fully universal bank. We provide every sort of services from a deposit, mortgage, uh, a mutual fund, consumer loan, everything. So our, our relation with our customers is, is broad. It's, it's really uh, very important. And we today um, can say that uh, we have deployed our platforms in the cloud. We created the first generation platform in the banking system. Um, totally uh, customer oriented, totally real time, totally integrated back three years. Now we're, we're in the second generation of that platform because we are migrating to the cloud and changing a lot of things in order to have just one platform in the world. And we have um, completely overhauled our management, uh, management team. And at the end of the day, we are creating a new breed of professional blending uh, bankers, good bankers and good digitals and creating a completely new way of running banking systems nowadays. Numbers. Um, net promoter score in the banking system is a metric for in order to assess um, customer satisfaction. Normally it's in, it's in the range of zero, even negative. Our number now is 19, but our app, banking app, is 63, which means as soon as we turn our customers into digital ones, they are extremely happy, extremely happy. Uh, the loyalty is higher, and we are, cut, cut, we are um, cutting back on costs dramatically. The problem is that we are now in the middle of the process uh, because we have to, to run the legacies. At the same time, we are creating a new entity. But the future is, is, uh, is bright. I think the banking system is, is going to be completely overhauled. There are 20,000 banks in the world. The number will be cut back dramatically over the next 5, 10, 15 years. And you, the regulators, have to understand that moment because uh, the process is going to be very painful for, for many banks. Consolidation is not going to be the solution, at least the full solution. The solution is to master the, the, uh, the technologies, the exponential technologies, uh, the cloud, uh, the AI, uh, uh, blockchain, everything. So my view is that there will be a new league of competitors made up of those guys, definitely, and some physical bonds like BBA, which were able to turn into a 
real digital house. We will be definitely a data-driven bank. Data allow us to, to make <coughs> decisions and automate things very rapidly. Um, my vision is very, 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 very upbeat, but the process will be very painful for many, many, many banks. And Cecilia, as a central banker mm -hmm. and someone responsible for regulation, given the pace of technology innovation, sometimes the adoption and usage runs way ahead of what traditional firms can adapt to, especially when they are struggling to make sure they're in compliance with your rules. Mm -hmm. How do you view the innovation and some of the new technologies as a regulator? And how do you balance the desire to move as fast as the technology is moving with, on the other hand, not wanting to advantage innovators or disadvantage existing firms? How do you think about that? Well, it's about striking the right balance. Uh, as a central banker, I am uh, fond of innovation because innovation is, uh, is in, in very important for growth. And uh, central banking is about uh, giving our best uh, contribution to a sustainable growth over time. Um, in, in the Swedish central bank, uh, we try to walk the talk in this supporting innovation in the sense that uh, we have uh, deliberately uh, stopped subsidizing the use of, of notes and coins, meaning our, our own product. Uh, so we have closed down uh, all the vaults in Sweden except for one and leave to the private sector, meaning banks and, and, and shops to, to, uh, to both organize and to share the costs of, of handling cash back and forth. Um, and this, in combination with uh, that Swedes are happy to adopt to new technology, has meant that we've reached a sort of a breaking point now in Sweden where, where most people are very happy to, to use cards or, or, or mobile phone uh, uh, apps. And we are actually supporting that as well because uh, there is, um, since a couple of years back, a very successful real-time payment app between individuals called Swish. Uh, which all the banks, big banks, are connected to. So as long as you have a bank account, you can connect your mobile phone number to it, and then people to people can, can do uh, real-time uh, payments between each other. And the reason for why this works 24-7, although banks are, are, are closed and our computer system is closed, is that we provide the, uh, the payment system in Sweden with a, with a credit in central bank money. So it works 24-7 uh, thanks to, to the Riksbank credit. So we try to, to not only talking about the need for innovation in this area, we also, we also try to, to support it. Now, um, I think it's uh, uh, important. You mentioned it in your introduction. We have the legal obligation to maintain a safe and efficient payment system. And I think it's important to distinguish uh, between, uh, when we analyze this, various payment methods and, and money in itself, um, because there are different yeah. kind of animals. Yeah. And yeah. I, I'd just like to give you a little bit of a demonstration. Um, so there are two versions of money in a society. Um, the, the version that most people think about is, is this version. This is a 200 krona Swedish bill. <coughs> it says issued by the Sveriges Riksbank. And it's the safest thing uh, in liquid asset you can, you can carry around, at least in Sweden. Uh, most people in Sweden have kind of turned away against this. And not most people. It's still very accessible and still very useful. But more and more people start to realize that you can, you can be very happy just walking around with a card, a debit card, or use this instant payment system on your app. Um, and um, is this a problem? Well, we, we don't know yet. Um, uh, we are, as I said, neutral uh, whether people want to use our kind of money or, or, or the commercial bank version of, of money. However, uh, the pace is going rapidly in Sweden, and uh, I see a uh, central bank version of money as still uh, a kind of money that is, has special uh, contents. It's the safest thing you can carry. From time to time, people would like to prefer, uh, prefer to use this kind, of, this kind of, of money and way of payment. So what we're doing now in, in Sweden is a kind of interesting project. We are looking into whether we should modernize our offer to the Swedish society, coming out with a, a digital version of our, our currency. Uh, for those who want to use that instead of, of the commercial bank alternative. So this idea that, that private money and, and, and central bank money 
can continue to, to work side by side and to some extent also uh, keep the competition up when it comes to, uh, to payment system efficiency. So I want to come back to that question because one of the trends that everybody is, is watching <laughs> incredibly closely is the rise of Bitcoin and the blockchain. And Bitcoin is viewed by some as being a separate new kind of money that is not controlled by any central bank and is therefore, in some people's eyes, it's better. Um, and so I definitely want to come back to you on that. Before we do that, I just want to go to David. David, you serve hundreds of thousands of institutional users with a, with a huge platform. And one of the things you've talked about is that Thomson Reuters has made the decision that instead of trying to build the technology perfectly itself and keep up with the innovation, they, you are actually treating it like a platform with APIs that other technology providers can plug into and information services providers. So talk about your platform and, and where you're taking it and, and ultimately um, what, what you need to do to compete. Yeah, thanks, Henry. And, and without wanting to get into competition with Dan here on bragging rights, I mean, I, I sometimes <laughs> think of Thomson Reuters as the first fintech innovator back in the 1800s when pigeons migrated to telegraph. There was a kind of distortionary move in, in the world. Uh, in fact, US dollar, GBP, that spot, count. Count. spot still in called, called cable um, because of the undersea cable. So, you know, we've lived through some step changes in technology over our 160 years. And I, I think what's going on now is another um, big, big step change. Um, I would describe it as exciting and exhausting, uh, just to keep track sometimes of everything that's happening. And I think the reasons for that are very clear. Um, the financial system, the financial players, the industry has spent seven years basically focusing on safety and on compliance. There's been a pent up demand, particularly from customers to innovate and deliver better services. So I think you're seeing a backlog of ideas and things coming forward. Um, you're seeing a huge amount of talent that's out there, many of whom actually worked in the financial institutions uh, with money, um, with ideas, and, and can do things quickly. And one of the reasons they can do things quickly is that compute power that used to be only available to big organizations is now available at very small incremental cost in the cloud, and you can do things very, very quickly on platforms that exist today in a way that you just couldn't, couldn't before. You can do it faster, cheaper than often the larger organizations like you know, ourselves and others on the panel um, to do it. You do have customers. There's a problem out there. Customers see the new experience on their mobile phones. They see all the apps they can use, and they're wanting that experience from the financial institutions, you know, many of whom have put nice front ends on their payment system but are still running a massive batch processing end of day, and, and they're not getting the experience they want. You see this huge regulatory burden that's you know, evolved over the last few years. Uh, there are 200 regulatory changes a day. There's this huge burden of, of things to do. And, you know, my view is the financial industry has, has responded to that by mainly throwing bodies at that problem. Compliance officers, you know, have grown in number. And it's now looking at how do we automate that and, and move that and change that. And then, of course, you've got the new technology, you know, blockchain, AI, biometrics, um, uh, things that have arrived and coming to maturity that weren't there before. So you have this, all of these things coming together at the same time. And the question, of course, for any financial player is, is what do you do? Because if there's a lesson learned from the previous distortions, the market structure changed. You know, it's very hard to see. It's very hard to see what that change might be. But the winners and losers in these distortions change, and we're seeing that now. So how do you keep up? We, of course, invest in these technologies. We have innovation labs, and we do things ourselves, and we invest. But we've also realized that we can't necessarily keep up with four men or four women in you know, a lab or a garage and how they can build things quickly. Why not open up our platform and, and let the commercials and the APIs you know, enable them to try things out and to innovate? And, and regulation plays a very strong part in this. And there's a big difference, I think, in the world between those regulators who've recognized that competition is as important as safety and have created an environment for innovation and those regulators who are either competition is here and safety is there and there's a little bit of a, a problem about which one's leading. And you can see that difference around the world at the moment. <coughs> um, so for us, this is a core part of our strategy, which is to open up the platform, allow third party providers to do that, allow them to innovate. You know, um, and what's important in this is in a highly regulated environment, you know, one man's app or one woman's um, fintech company is another bank's virus. You know, the security and the other things you've got to do. So we allow the permissioning for them to be distributed around the world you know, using our infrastructure to do that um, as well. 
So we've identified two trends, digitization and mobile, that are really at the core of driving this. I would, I would ask if there's one more, and I would say from the experience of Business Insider, which we started about 10 years ago, one of the things that's been very helpful to us is that there's a new generation of consumers, and in our case, media consumers, who don't have the habits that I grew up with and the financial publications that I grew up with. And we've been able to grow because Folks who are just getting interested in news and financial and, and business news, they're open to new brands. And in financial services, for older people like me, the, there is such trust built up in banking brands and other financial brands over time that it, it feels very risky to, especially with your money, trust a new startup or a new brand you haven't heard about. And yet, younger people just starting their own financial lives don't have that, and they're much more open to that. So how much, as you, as you look at what is driving your growth, how much of that is that? And, how, and are, you, is your, are your user bases, are they skewing younger, or are you reaching everybody at the same time? Yeah, the user base is skewing younger, and they, they expect different things. They expect a far more digital experience. They, they also expect you to you know, not just be one source of news. Yeah, they, they expect you to bring um, all of the environment to them, and a lot of it's noise, and they want to filter. They want to understand what's really going on. And we've seen many examples where, you know, on social media, things are reported that aren't necessarily true and right. And <coughs> yeah, that might be fine in a in a consumer environment, but if you're making big split-second trading decisions or investing decisions, that can be a real problem. Um, but you can't ignore it because it's out there. Uh, we've actually built tools that that look and analyze at the social media and try and distinguish between fact and fiction. Um, and do that. It's a very powerful way of extracting news from all that noise uh, that's happening. And it's got great you know, support because people, they want the trusted wire, they want the, the, the people behind it, but they also want to know what's going on and, and have some understanding of whether it's something I should act on or is this noise and I should just ignore that. Can I, can I make a comment on that? Please. <clears throat> when we are asking her if trust is the most fundamental thing when it comes to the financial service, so I, I, and even for, you know, it's no matter what kind of technology you are using, you are, you are, you are using that. So I mean, trust is most, most fundamental thing. When, if you're talking about here, yeah, you can use many different ways to, for example, to do consumer marketing, to get many users in the short period of time. But if you want to sustain a business, you have to be based, have to be, that has to be built based upon trust. I mean, kind of protect the interest of the consumers, protect them, give them their best security, create value for them. That's the only thing you can want to develop a long-term sustainable business. So we, we, we've been, you know, for Anipay, we've been in, our, in this sector for 12 years. You know, from day one, Anipay was not created to, to provide a payment solution. Actually, it was created to, to solve the issue of trust barrier. Because at that time, I mean, uh, the retail <coughs> platform was created by the center. They don't see each other. That's 13 years ago. So how can I facilitate the transaction by removing the trust barrier? So we create kind of escrow payment. So by it, we send the money to escrow. Then uh, the escrow account notified our center, OK, we got the money. You can do the delivery. Then our buyer received the money, said, I confirmed the receipt of the good products. So the escrow kind of release the money to the, to, the, to the center. So this is about trust. So if you, this kind of uh, I mean, mechanism to greatly, I mean, just to remove the barrier of trust. So from day one, we are, you know, all our focus is on whether we can create value, I mean, for our consumers. So I mean, what I would see the cost kind of centric, centricity is the most fundamental things of your business. And you have to keep on strengthening on that keep providing interest for them, keep creating, creating venue, uh, venue for them. So all of our innovation, we keep innovating for the past 12 years. The only thing to do, we did, did not innovate for innovation. We innovate for our venue creation. Where we can really create venue for consumers, we don't consider from profit-making perspectives. If you can create venue, you definitely will have profit. You will have your consumers, right? You have a great user base. If you don't create venue, if you don't protect them, if you don't provide a trust, Long-term trust for them. There, you will business will go away. Even if I build something, but it's going away very, very quickly. That's my, my comment. 
I think that foundation is based on security, it's based on privacy, it's based on service yep. um, as well. Those are the things that uh, form the foundation of trust. But if you look at surveys across the world, um, in many ways, technology companies now are some of the most trusted companies in the world, whether it be a Google, whether it be an Alipay, whether it be a PayPal. Um, very strong brands, very strong trust. And then if you look generationally, it's very interesting to see the differences in generations as well. The gen tech, those who were born with screens in their hands, their public-private boundaries are much different than older generations. The thing that makes Venmo so popular is that it took a transaction, this sort of P2P transaction, and turned it into an experience. It turned it into every single Venmo, 95% of all Venmo transactions are shared with friends. And, and Venmo, comments. for those of you who don't know, is a system, app-based system where individuals can pay each other small amounts. Yeah, it's the leading app in the US for the millennial generation on how they manage and move money. And every one of those transactions, they can opt to share with their friends, and they can comment on it. And 90% plus comment on their transactions and then share it. Most of you in the audience will probably never do that. Um, but there's very, very big differences between generations. And I think as we think about where the system is going, and that's really kind of what um, I really spent a lot of time thinking about, 10 years from now, who is the next generation of the consumer? What are their needs going to be? We've got 2 billion people in the world right now that are underserved. They need a basic system and platform for financial transactions. And I don't think that we should extrapolate what was, but we ought to reimagine in a world of mobile and software and connectivity, how would you build a financial services platform to serve that um, sort of the, um, the majority of citizens so that managing and moving money is a right for all citizens and not really a privilege for the affluent. And that, to me, is, is a critical element of what we're trying to do. That is a very interesting because, of course, you can imagine we are trying to, to know what will the banking system look like in 5, 10, 50 years from now. Um, now we are seeing an explosion of startups and um, companies who are creating specific products um, uh, throughout the value chain. For the time being, there is no one Sub, uh, player who is able to supply the entire value chain. This is our, this is our <coughs> mission, to, to supply the entire value, value, value chain. Um, if you want to be a real player, a successful player in the future, you have to understand how the digital work, how the digital the world works. First, margins very low, extreme transparency, lack of conflict of interest, and as a bank, we can't pretend to sell products. We have to become the real advi trusted advisor of, of our customers. So our vision is, over the next years, and we are working on that, we, have, we, we will have a platform where we will try to, we won't produce our products anymore, hmm? because we don't want to, to have conflict of interest with our customers. We will pick up the best products and, and, um, products and, and experiences in, in the world out there, Innovation is, is, is going to be out there in the hands of the apps or so. We will package those experience and products, and we will produce a specific experience for our own customers based on AI, big data, big data, and so so. At the end of the day, we are creating an ecosystem where we want to serve not 63 million customers. We will need probably hundreds of millions of customers because the margins will be extremely low, and we need to scale in order to, to work with very low marginal costs. The, the question is, how, uh, what will the competition league look like? So I think few numbers of banks, a few numbers of players. We won't be a bank. We won't be a service company. And we will work not just with financial products, but other sort of products. Because so, as soon as we have data, we can turn the data into a deposit or into a health product. So what is going to happen, in, is gonna happen over the next five, 10, few years, it's really incredible in terms of change. And nothing is decided yet. You have the Facebooks, the Googles, mm -hmm. 
and financial, yeah, um, uh, PayPal, the BBVAs, probably a couple of few old banks, and startups. <coughs> Nothing else. And we are talking about dozens of pledges, not thousands of pledges. I'd like to challenge a little bit about your concept of trust, because um, trust can be easily uh, disappear. Uh, uh, at the end of the day, people want to know, is my money safe and are they accessible yeah. to me? Is my money safe and accessible to me? Yeah. Um, and I think we learned a hard lesson. I mean, I appreciate there are um, surveys showing that technological firms high rank in, in values and, and trust. But, but those were the situation also with the big banks. And then 2008 appeared, and people really across the world started to ask, is my money safe and accessible? And, uh, and it turned out that a lot of wasn't. Uh, and even uh, if you had your money involved included in a deposit insurance scheme, a lot of people started to move their money around because they wanted to have it accessible. Um, so I, I, uh, kind of a word of caution here is that, uh, uh, yes, trust so far, and perhaps this generation is, is uh, 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 happy to adopt a new technology, but there will be times in history we still haven't figured out uh, the avoidance of financial instability and the, the various kinds of bank runs. There will be times again uh, when people don't trust the place where they have put their money in. Uh, and then the crucial question is, are they certain? Are they sure? Uh, are they protected by deposit insurance scheme? And, and if they're not, we're going to see a lot of flows back and forth and a lot of instability, the same way as we saw in 2008. And we have to look into the fact that this can happen again. So regulation is so important. Regulation will either accelerate or probably hold back the process, but regulators will shape in some way will shape the future of the financial system. So it's very important for them to balance innovation, customers' um, customer rights, and of course, uh, uh, financial stability. Mm -hmm. um, that is, <coughs> is regulators are not prepared, by the way, today to understand what's going to happen. And they need to hire people, you know, understanding the cloud, many things. So we have to be, you know, to pay attention to events because the role of regulators will change or will shape the, the new financial system. So yeah, we'd love to open up for your questions in, in, in a few minutes. I just want to ask one more question, which I, I alluded to earlier, which is there's once again excitement about Bitcoin. Bitcoin, for those of you who don't know, is an electronic currency that has been the object of speculation on and off for the last 10 years or so. Everybody Big knows. price run up and then collapse and now a new price run up. And Bitcoin is underpinned by a technology called the blockchain, which a lot of people think has implications way beyond Bitcoin itself. But <coughs> first, I just want to and I open it up to anyone who wants to comment on Bitcoin. But Cecilia wanted to ask you, given your position, a lot of people say Bitcoin is a new form of money. And it's a, it, it, one of its advantages is that it's not controlled by any central bank that might be politically motivated and might devalue it depending on a particular time. And we are starting to see lots of transactions with Bitcoin that are cross-border and outside of the banking system, which a certain segment of users are very excited about. They like that. So what do you think about Bitcoin? Well, um as an economist looking at what money is, uh, it's both a payment method, it's a store of value. And uh, in order to make this efficient, it has to be a stable store of value. Uh, and you can do that either through pegging your currency to another currency or as many of the central banks are doing now, DAO have, um, have inflation targeting. And this stable store of value, uh, that is something that Bitcoin or these other cryptocurrencies does not have. Uh, they are volatile, as you said. Uh, you, it's more like a, a speculation asset, a financial asset, rather than, than actually uh, money in the economist's sense of view. Uh, so uh, I usually, when people t introduce this question, uh, are you seeing bitcoins as a competitor to, uh, to Swedish currency? I say, well, do you use bitcoin? No, of course not, they say. And why not? Well, it's not stable. Well, there you see. We still have rather a strong product to offer from, from the central bank. If people don't like it, uh, to, to, to kind of, um, they don't trust the state, yeah, you can, you can make transactions through other ways of, of methods. You can use bitcoin, you can use black cats, cupcakes. That's up to you, you know, if, if, you, if, you, if you think that's uh, efficient and safe. 
Uh, we provide uh, um, uh, the kind of the state option, uh, which is safe and it's efficient and it's widely distributed and it has a stable store of value. I love the technology behind it though, and that's very interesting and I'm learning a lot about that. Dave. Yeah, I, and I want to come in on the technology side that underpins it because I think blockchain distributed ledgers uh, is potentially transformational. There's lots of experimentation going on. I think 17 might be the year that some of the experiments start, start to work. But I want to link it back to the trust discussion because what I've really learned about this technology without getting into the technology is blockchain and distributed <coughs> ledgers distributes trust amongst a group of people who have to work together who don't necessarily trust each other. So the financial system, what distributed ledgers does is a group of participants have to then collectively agree a standard of how they federate that, that trust. And the financial industry hasn't, in history, been particularly good at collaboration. Um, it tends to be lots of groups of people sort of collaborating, sort of competing. And this actually offers a way of changing how that operates and how that works. It also does something very interesting around utilities. And there's a lot of questions around, well, you do utilities need to exist in a world where you've got distributed ledgers. Does my clearinghouse um, go away? I think they exist, but they change. Their role actually changes from one of, we don't have to centralize ledgers and infrastructure and be the source of that central trust. We can now federate that around the participants, be it payments, be it securities clearing, be it transactions, uh, in a different way. And I think that is really exciting because park the technology aside, it, it changes how the participation of the industry has to function for this to work. And as was said, you know, no one player can solve the whole financial industry on their own. They actually have to work together. And if there's one thing I've found, particularly here, is the amount of discussion around collaboration and partnership is at an all-time high, underpinned by, I think, some of this technology. And that's really interesting. Yeah, I also want to echo to David's comment. Yeah, I agree with you, actually. You know, from my view, the, the blockchain, it's, it's not the essence of blockchain. It's not about decentralization, but trust, actually. Blockchain used the, the distributed edge in a Echoism consensus to create a trust among the parties without relying on our own centralized party. That's the key. Sure. So, so I mean, uh, so where you know you can uh, a lot of, I mean, there are a lot of applications we can use. I mean, blockchain into that. For example, the where the trust is strong, trust is needed. You can actually use blockchain to, to 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 really I mean into that apply blockchain technology into that areas. Actually, we already, in, in end financial, we use, uh, we are a, a couple of pilot projects while using blockchain to, I mean, totally change the, I mean, the process, other, 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 I mean, kind of game. For example, the philanthropy, you know, by using, I mean, blockchain technology, <coughs> you can really trace all the flows of the deleted funds come from every, each one, and then you get management fee, then the fund will be used to, to I mean, support specific project or specific person. All this using your blockchain, I mean, this really, really can increase the transparency of that, I mean, philanthropy projects. This is one of the examples. We can also can see if we can apply the blockchain to the supply chain finance because all the transaction records is unchangeable, right? So give it a strong capability to better manage the risk, credit risk, and to you, maybe you can grant your credit, I mean, to the, to the, to the, to the I mean, uh, companies in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the supply chain. So just two examples. So I mean, that, that trust, you know, I mean, this trust is a, it's a, new, it's a new technology to create trust, to bring the trust to the, to the game, so that's that's interesting. Yeah, great. So let's take some questions. I have a few more that we'll follow up with, but go ahead. Uh, yes, microphone is coming. Thank you very much. I'm a journalist as well. I'm Jorge Valero. I work for the Spanish Daily El Economista, and I would like to, uh, an open question uh, to the panel. Despite uh, none of the fintech players are a systemic player, could the next financial crisis start? in the fintech world, because there could be some sort of chain reaction, precisely because the regulation right now is very low. Good question. Um, for the time being, uh, startups or fintechs uh, represent a very, very small part of the 
back in value. <coughs> so I don't see any systemic risk today. But uh, over the next few years, we, we, we will see how those guys you know, uh, develop their business and, and can, theoretically, can, can uh, pose a, a system of risk. So again, regulators have to follow those events and, and to take pre preemptive uh, pre measures. Cecilia, do you want to address that too? Oh, well, it's, uh, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't rule it out. Uh, that would be a, a bit <coughs> stupid. Um, um, as I think I agree uh, with the previous uh, speaker that uh, they have a small part. Uh, mainly the way I see fintech is, uh, is taking, uh, uh, creating new interfaces, uh, but still very much in the established systems. Um, so, but, but being a regulator, being on the public sector side is about to understand this and how it affects the infrastructure. And I try to have, a, I have a very humble approach here because keep in mind, I try to keep in mind that um, um, the, the global financial crisis started with these subprime structures. And when they started to reach the newspapers, um, they was considered to be you know, just a small part of the market and uh, not too much to worry about five, six, eight percent of, of the mortgage market. But it turned out to be the weak chain and the link that it created a, 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 a fire of it, of the, across the world. So be humble and follow the uh, de development is my, my Yes, attitude. I remember very distinctly the word contained mm -hmm. used many times mm -hmm. to describe subprime and then the whole world melted down. So mm -hmm. very Just good point. Just comment on a quick couple of things on that. I think um, when you reach the <clears throat> size of either an ant or a, or a PayPal, um, we follow all the regulations and compliance that any bank does uh, around there. So we take that extremely seriously. We can't operate uh, in 200 countries and serve 200 million people without full compliance around all of the regulatory environment. Second, we have a tremendous amount of data and information. And data and information is very powerful in terms of looking at abnormalities or um, uh, things that just don't look right in the system. And it's very important. There's a difference between a startup and an established FinTech player. We have over 6 billion transactions that go through our platform. We analyze every one of those. I think the place that all of us, whether it be almost any industry, traditional banking or FinTech, is uh, cybersecurity is a issue of tremendous uh, importance to all of us in the financial sector. I don't care if you're a fintech company or a traditional uh, banking company. Um, there's a tremendous amount of interest from bad guys in terms of compromising systems. And it no longer is sufficient to build deep moats or high turrets to keep people out. What you really need to be able to do is have a tremendous amount of data and very smart modeling and algorithms to spot abnormal behavior to prevent it from leaving the system. So scale and big data and modeling is incredibly important. And I would say that uh, FinTech um, at scale prides itself on those pieces of it. We need to always improve constantly, give it constantly, iterate on that. But I think all of us in the financial system, I think that is the systemic risk, is cybersecurity. Let's take another question. There's one over here. Bekir uh, Pakdemirli from Tuxel. I'm directing a question to you. Uh, we understood the hassles and problems of the uh, trust issue for the blockchain currencies. Should we expect to see any currencies issued by the central banks in the near future? And then, uh, will you be ready or welcome in this situation in the future? Mm -hmm. Is your question whether we will use the blockchain technology or not, or, or issue the central bank not, digital not currency or not? Not necessarily you, any of the you know, uh, central banks in the world. You know. Well, I, I can only speak for my own uh, central bank, uh, which is the Swedish one. And we, we, I outlined a speech in November last year where I kind of looked at the situation saying that um, 
we have reached a break, breaking point among Swedes where they kind of turn uh, away from uh, notes and the usage of notes and coins more and more. And they are happy to use um, uh, the commercial bank's uh, money and, and products. Um, and then we have to look into whether uh, we should come up with a more modern, <coughs> digitalized or electronic version of, of central bank money for all those people who doesn't want to or doesn't get access to uh, the commercial banks' uh, um, services and, and, and systems. Uh, I think, uh, you know, as I, as I mentioned before, there are two kinds of money, and I think we should continue to uh, provide two kinds of money. And if this history, if it, I mean, this was a novelty 350 years ago yeah. uh, with paper money, but it, we have moved on since then. And, and then it's just a question of whether we should update uh, and come out with an electronic version or not. And that is the work that the central bank, not only my central bank, but other central banks are looking into the, the next, uh, next, next years to come. I don't have a forecast of whether it will happen or when it will happen, uh, but it's definitely a kind of homework we all have to do, and especially us since, um, since um, uh, people are rejecting our, uh, our, um, our, our current version. I think both of those versions that you're holding up digitize. <laughs> uh, they, that's what happens. They digitize. You're not going to have a card uh, 20 years from now. Let's just like try to take time out of the equation a little bit so you don't debate whether it's five years from now or seven years from now. But all of those versions begin to digitize. And of course, we would take those digital uh, versions into uh, the platform and system. I also strongly believe in something that you were talking about, that no one company or um, government entity can do all of this. We have to collaborate together. That is essential to go and do. I actually don't think the battle is between us. I think the battle is a war on cash, a, a war on waste that goes out there. We're just at the very beginning. And if we actually have open platforms, and digital platforms, you can take the best of the assets that we can bring and the best of the assets that the traditional financial service can bring and come up with value propositions that serve customers and different segments of the market better than either of us could do alone. I think we need to figure out a way of doing that because that, to me, is the home run. That, to me, is the way that we actually become allies in the advancement of digital payments uh, together. And I think we've got to figure out those collaboration models. We've got to have the right platforms and open API sets to be able to go do that. It needs to be in a trust uh, foundation. But um, uh, you, it's a little bit like you know waves on the sand. You're not going to stop this from moving forward. None of us are going to stop this from moving forward. We now need to figure out how do we make it a safe really safe as we possibly can? And how do we work together to advance it? Because if you can, the value that that can create, the inclusion that that can do, could really make a difference in the lives of so many people uh, in the world. And that's a goal and a vision that all of us should have to move forward on. Right, let's take one more question, and then I have a concluding one. What do you think is the future of cards? Do you think they exist five years from now? So, uh, you, you're so talking like talking debit or credit? Or Is that what you're talking about? Debit, debit or credit? credit card? Physical card or virtual card. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, the form is not important. And form, right, right. Yes, exactly. form is not important. As long as they can identify that card, that account belongs to you, that's critical. Yeah. What, you know, right? Yes, yeah, someday those cards go away. But it's like money. Like, people have predicted the demise of cash forever. It's been around for hundreds of years. It's not going away anytime soon either. So it's just a, it's a matter of how quickly does this evolve going forward. But I mean, I think you look at some experimentation like what's going on in India right now, which is really quite astonishing uh, what, they're, uh, what the prime minister is trying to do there. There they are making a play on identity and digital to really take away a lot of the leakage in the system and the waste that goes on and really um, try to accelerate digital payments. I mean, there have been speeches where there won't be ATMs uh, in India. I mean, since the demonetization, you've seen digital wallets in India grow 40 percent 
week over week. Um, so, I mean, it, I think it really depends. And like, like you, I would not predict a time frame on it, but I think we can be certain that all of these forms digitize as we look forward. And, and let's, let's end on that and expand on where we're headed. We've identified a few different things, the importance of mobile, the importance of digitization, leaving aside a specific time frame. Francisco, you've talked about how the bank becomes a service provider, a platform with best of breed and, and all the different pieces. Some other predictions, fearless predictions about where we're headed. In the banking so, system? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's very difficult to, to know what's going to happen over the next 5, 10, 15 years. But because um, technology is evolving. By the way, cybersecurity is a big, big thing which has to be addressed, not just by the banks and by the authorities. Yep. The authorities has to be really uh, involved in how to tackle that, uh, that danger. On the other hand, you have uh, the big guys, Facebook, for example, hmm? or Google, where they are managing AI you know, ahead of the everyone, and in my view, the AI will, will be a real game changer. Blockchain is a game changer, but uh, at the end of the day, it's going to be seized by everyone because I think blockchain is going to be a standard. Blockchain, I mean, distributed ledgers will be a standard. But the difference will be, will be made by the guys who really, really manage data and AI. And how, how does AI play in financial services and technology? Wow. You know, when you have the data and you have the, the right performance and the right data, data scientists, you take the data in real time, in our case, and we turn the data into information, information into knowledge. That you have, for example, to predict, and we are giving the services to our customers what's going to happen with their finances over the next three, four months or years. If you are in a restaurant, we have also those, those apps. If you want to, to, to consume a good bottle of wine, our apps are saying, don't do that. Otherwise, you won't pay your, your mortgage at the end of the day. In, in, in other words, a I'm huge not sure amount, I like that. Yeah. A huge <laughs> amount of information about not just your present, but your future. You're, you're mentioning uh, you're, uh, some other trends. I want to bring up a new concept we call tech thing. You know, people, a lot of people today that are talking about fintech, fintech. No, we are talking about a tech thing. It's not, it's not just a play on words, actually. It's different. Today, I don't believe the many tech companies, they really know how to deal with the risk. We're talking about a thing. It's all about dealing with risks. I agree that having data is very important, give us a, good, a, a potential capability to deal with risk. But having data does not necessarily mean you, are, you can deal with the risk. So tech fee meaning we are using technology to empower, I mean, banking systems to upgrade, upgrade their service products, to work together, to partner together, to serve the consumers, serve the SMEs, right? We are seeing that, I mean, fintech com tech fee companies have, you know, I mean, the, part, the relationship between tech fee companies and our traditional banking institutions, they are more cooperative than competitive. So it's about how we're using technology to upgrade the entire systems by working very closely together. It's not about just disrupt. Um, ask one question. How many tech companies can really disrupt, I mean, uh, in the area of, you know, in, in the, in the you know, very, I mean, uh, professionally in the area of, the, uh, in, in the sector of, I mean, trust, dealing with trust? We don't believe that. You can see a lot of troubles, I mean, uh, some some companies make, right? So we are seeing that we position us as a tech thing companies by using tech, big data, cloud computing, or all this technology to partner with, I mean, traditional institutions by working very closely together to co-offering, to upgrade our service products, to serve the SMEs, to serve the consumers, to serve those underserved before. So that's uh, that's uh, that's kind of concept I want to bring up. So we don't should not don't only look at want to disrupt someone else. We should look at how to work together constructively by offering the additional value, the value we have not been offered before to a group of people which are, I mean, little guys which are underserved or unserved. So that's called inclusive. So working together. 
focusing on, focus, focus on our inclusive, so. Yeah. Thanks, Eric. Cecilia, we have a couple minutes left. Any yeah, very any? short. Just uh, from a regulated perspective, striking the right balance between safety, efficiency, uh, innovation, flexibility, and standards are efficient. Second thing is uh, we have to try to be as technologically neutral as we can. Now we are having cards and phones, but perhaps in the future we're going to use finger nice and, and you know just a, the various kinds of new standards. Uh, and the, the third thing I think is important is to make changes be a bit gradual. Um, this is about people's trust in money. It's among the most serious things that society, in my view at least, can, is, is, um, is, is, can offer people. Don't experiment too much. And it's important to remember that although we all feel that we're living in a fast-moving world, I mean, not much, much have happened, actually. We used gold and no coins for thousands of years, and then 350 years, we started to do paper notes, and now we go digital, but the paper notes and the coins are still there. Let them work side by side, and let the uh, evolvement do the rest. Great. David, you have one quick last word. Final prediction. I think everyone's going to get serious about fintech and where they're investing. Um, in the coming years. I think, if I'm bold, the end of centralized infrastructures, trust is distributed um, across that. And I think the most precious thing in a few years we'll all be looking after is not our credit card, but our digital identity. Great. I want to thank all of you for joining us and thank the panel. It was a privilege to be here.